Hi, I'm Dave Finney, owner and winemaker of Warren Swiss Cellars, and you're watching Understanding Wine with Austin Demon. Dave Finney, uh, owner and winemaker of Orange Swift Cellars. Uh, I was, it's kind of a long story, but I'll try and make it short. I was in Italy for a semester studying and uh, got into drinking wine, uh, which then led me into visiting some wineries and uh, really kind of fell in love with the vineyard side of it. And so I went back to college and uh, started working in a retail wine shop and realized that. I didn't want to go into wine sales, I wanted to go into either working in vineyards or wineries. So ended up right after college moving up to Napa and working for Robert Mondavi Winery as a temporary seller uh, harvest position. Um, and then went from there to Opus One to Whitehall Lane and then uh, that was 97 and in 98 I uh, started Orange Swift Cellars because uh, I just uh, really loved it. but realized if it was going to be this kind of hard work, I wanted to kind of do it for myself. So, yeah, I worked on a on the night shift on an all uh, Mexican crew, and with some great guys. But what they taught me, uh, a lot of winemaking isn't you know the stuff, the kind of romantic stuff, you know, blending wines and being out in vineyards and doing wine tastings and that kind of stuff. It's uh, so much of it is just being clean and you know just just work, it's just cellar work and so it it was really good to see it right from you know grapes to wine um, and be involved in every part of it which is what I did for geez, eight or ten years I was essentially cellar work um, you know at some capacity and without that base uh, I don't think you know it just I just don't think it works Prisoner started in 2000, um, and it was actually started. Uh, it was a I don't want to say a winemaking mistake, but um, we had some Zinfandel that we picked very sweet, some Cabernet that we already knew was going to be declassified because 2000 just wasn't my favorite year, um, and a bunch of small lots of Petit Syrah, Charbonneau, um, and I believe Syrah at the time. And so, and I didn't want the wine to have any residual sugar. So, long story short, is I sort of threw them all together just to see what would happen, um, knowing they were all very, you know, great pieces on their own. And it made, you know, this great red wine. So now I had to come up with a label. And so the Prisoner label is a Goya etching. It was a gift to me from my parents. Um, my brother at the time was a graphic designer, and so he kind of put the sunset in the background. It was 385 cases, and I said, look, you know, and everybody told me how it wasn't going to work. It's non-varietal. You know, it's uh, the label's creepy, the name sucks, yada, yada, yada. So I figured, hey, it's 385 cases. If it doesn't work out, we'll just try something new next year. Um, and uh, so actually it worked out. And uh, in 2000, December of 2009, uh, I sold the Prisoner brand, only that part of Warren Swift and Saldo uh, to Hineas Vintners. Um, and at the time we sold it, it was 75,000 cases. Um, so. Yeah, that's kind of the, the short version of that story. I guess in all the winemaking, it's it's I'm there's sort of winemakers that fall into different classes of what you uh, where you like to spend your time, and really where I like to spend my time is in the vineyards and sourcing vineyards, finding vineyards, um, which uh, again through Prisoner I had to do a lot of and still do a lot of and love it. I mean every day that I hear I gotta go buy more fruit it's just a great day because I get to go bird dog you know new vineyards and meet new people um, and just look at different sites so what we try to do is find these sites and then uh, you know obviously it's specific to the varietal we need and all that so find these sites and then uh, pick them at sort of the, the perfect time which is Kind of a joke because there is no perfect day, but we try to get as close as we can, um, and then get them in the winery and 
basically it's not a completely laissez-faire, you know, hands-off deal, but we try to not man manipulate them too much other than, I mean, we use obviously all the, you know, modern sort of winemaking tricks, but there's no, we don't, we don't do a lot of sort of aggressive stuff because hopefully we've done all the work in the vineyard um, and we've picked the right sites, um, which is what led me to T66 and going to France and everything was basically because I came out, a friend took me out to this beautiful town in the south of France and these vineyards were just so insane. It was just, I mean, it was a no-brainer and then I started tasting the wines that some of the other guys and, and men and women that were making there and it was just, you know, it was just a total expression of, uh, of the sites which, you know, I hate the word terroir but it, it really is sort of terroir driven wines. Um, and then the labels, you know, spending all that time going and looking at vineyards, you have a lot of time in the truck so to speak and you know you hear a name here and you kind of come up with an idea and you know it's just sort of the fun part of it and, and luckily you've got a long time before when you pick the grapes to when you bottle to sort of have some fun with the labels so um well it's funny it's be i mean we try to pick grapes to ripe i mean i definitely pick ripe i mean i'd fall into that category um and and it's because we're trying to make the wines approachable and drinkable. Um, I don't want to say right away, but but um, sooner rather than later. And I just that's stylistically that's that's the kind of wines that I just like. You know, ripe wines. Um, you know, we try to also incorporate. We don't pick everything ripe. We actually try to pick some things um, a little less ripe to have some structure, to have some tannins, because you have to have that. Uh, we began to uh, begun to incorporate a little bit more oak, so that we're also getting some oak tannins without you know getting too much oak because uh, the natural idea of you're picking that ripe would just be to throw a bunch of oak at it too because it can definitely handle the oak um, but I think that starts to change the aromas um, and also the tannin structure um, but and then sort of the whole other end of it is uh, you know once you've done something like we have with with say prisoner you know for 13 years 14 years you can't just all of a sudden switch it up you know if we were to do a dramatic change in style or direction it kind of wouldn't be fair to the consumer um, because that's what they've gotten to know and gotten to like uh, having said that you know I don't I, I actually like wines with a little bit more structure uh, and we're moving in that direction where we can and that's how the Cabernets the Cabernets are meant to be right but also have structure and ageability so it's just also it's not only it's not just about what I want to drink or what I want to make. It's what people have come to like, and uh, and and you know we don't want to disappoint people. Mm -hmm. um, and having said that, I don't think I I still really enjoy wines with a lot of fruit. Um, and if you do it right, and that's part of the a component of the wine, you know it, it should work. Ah. Uh. I think a lot of it's just luck and timing and, you know, right place, right time, all that kind of cliche stuff, but um, we already had a very established distribution network, um, so it wasn't like we were trying to go out and meet people and, and spread the word. The word had kind of been spread, uh, so we'd laid a lot of the groundwork, not really even on purpose because, you know, we don't do a lot of sales and marketing, um, but also what we've always tried to do is kind of over-deliver. Uh, as much as possible and, and maybe not everybody would agree with that but just on if we make a great wine and we could sell it and it was selling out and uh, as it has for X amount of years at you know twenty dollars I'm just picking a number then the obvious sort of economic uh, thing to do would be to raise the price um, you know but what we'd like to try to do or what we try to do is just over deliver so if the wines should be worth forty dollars well we're gonna sell it for thirty and, and again since it's such an arbitrary concept unless you're really looking at all these reports and, and sort of you know getting sort of stuck in the minutiae of the numbers for us it's uh, we'd much rather uh, just know that someone's going to be happy because they're getting a smoking deal on a wine and, uh, and we try to do that I mean I'm not saying everybody would agree with me but that's the concept is just over deliver um, on everything uh, you know a long time ago uh, someone told me you should never have to sell wine and what they meant by that is that if you have the right wine at the right price with the right package, then it should just shell, sell itself, which kind of makes sense. And But getting those three components right is a lot easier said than done. And again, I'm not saying that we do it every time, but 
if you have, sometimes you'll have a great wine, but the packaging isn't that great and it's too expensive, or you'll have a wine where the packaging's great, but the wine's not good and it's too expensive or whatever, you know. But to get, to try to hit on all those three things is what we're always striving to do. And sometimes the easiest way to do it is leave a little money on the table. Oh, geez. <laughs> That's a tough one. Um, yeah, I mean, the, probably the easiest way or the most important thing uh, would be it's how I met my wife, and how I have my kids, and, you know, how I can, you know, do what we do and sort of be involved in an honorable business where you, know, you meet a lot of good people and hopefully make people happy with what, what they have that night for dinner. So, um, yeah, it's probably be it. Oh, geez, that it's just wine. Like in most countries, that it's just a part of the meal as much as potatoes or steak or whatever salt is, and that um, it should be enjoyed and it shouldn't be put up into this like stratosphere of something it's not or, or misconstrued or, 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 you know, mysticized or whatever. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, what we do is it's, it's not like, you know, anybody can do it. It's not magic. And the, to convert grape juice into alcohol is very simple. Um, and so it's just bringing it to the people, so to speak. That sounds really cheesy and proletariat, but, um, you know, and, and just again, in so many other countries where we've been, we've seen that it's just, it's just, it's just, it's, it's very important, but it's not important because marketing has made it important. It's important because that's important to people to have with food and with family and stuff.